three bluffing spots today. Shh. Don't tell the opponents you run all the bluffs. Something a lot of people do wrong is they are proud of their extravagant bluffs and they show them. But shh, no, 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 no. Don't tell your opponents how absurdly you are playing, especially on the turn in the river, because then they're going to start calling and then you're going to start losing. So today, I'm going to be sharing with you three secrets, three big bluffing spots that you and, you know, sometimes me are not taking. It's hard to find all the right bluffing spots, which is why, from an exploitative point of view, when your opponent bets the flop, bets the turn, bets the river, you should fold a ton, right? Because most people are not finding all the bluffs they need to. And I'm about to show you three big bluffing spots where most people do not find those bluffs using game theory simulations to show you, to prove that this is true. Best coach in the world. Perfect timing. Well, thank you, Van Peoples. I appreciate it. I want to thank all of you for being here with me today. We see James, regular dude, Dr. Dante, John G, Peter, James, Jacob, the freak. Lots and lots and lots of people here. What stakes does this apply to? All of them. Microstakes has lots of stations, so this may not apply. Microstakes has lots of stations, except for on the river. Believe it or not. I have millions and millions of hands of data where I have pretty definitive proof that everyone, everyone folds too often on the river. Now, of course, you may find that your particular opponent does actually call down with stuff like bottom pair. They're going to call your flop bet, your turn bet, and your river bet with bottom pair. If that's the case, don't bluff those people, okay? Okay. You have to use a little bit of common sense here. Does this apply to people who call with queen high and better every time? No. Don't try to bluff people who are going to call with queen high and better every time. Instead, just value bet. Middle pair all three streets, right? That'd be ridiculous to do normally, but obviously you have to take advantage of what your opponents do wrong. Assuming, though, you don't know what your opponents do wrong, or you think they fold just a little bit too much, we're going to be going through these three bluffing spots that you are almost certainly not taking in, to be fair. I'm not taking them all the time either. All right, weak, tight poker. Players do not win anymore. They may win against the absolute worst players, like we just discussed here. If your opponents are extreme calling stations, you don't need to bluff, right? Just value bet. But if you want to be a big winner, you have to steal pots that do not belong to you. And you can actually still have quite a big edge in today's games. I've been playing quite high stakes tournaments online and I'm still winning at something like seven big blinds per hundred EV, right? And I'm not even the best poker player in the world or anything, right? But I'm studying, I'm finding player pool exploits and we're taking advantage of what the opponents do incorrectly. You have to study and you have to improve. And I'm glad that you are all here today because hopefully this helps all of you improve. I'm sure some of you are going to go bluff off your stacks next time you play and you're going to say that Jonathan will cost me money, but Remember, the goal is to win all the equity. If you win all the equity, even though it may not translate to a tournament win every single time, you'll win all the money in the long run. The neat thing about poker, too, is that if you just make profitable plays, if you just play better than your opponent, you will win in the long run. It really is that simple. Volume cures variance. I'm actually going to be showing you a graph from one of our poker coaching members. It's just like straight up. Playing tournaments, because he's playing relatively small field games with a big edge. You do that over and over again, it's pretty hard to lose. So today, I'm going to be giving you three bluffing spots to help you crush your opponents that will heavily increase your win rate, because most people do not take these spots. All right, first things first, turning a pair into a bluff. Have you ever done that? I remember I used to never do that. Why would you turn a pair into a bluff, I would say? Well, turns out there are good reasons for it. Too many players autopilot and overvalue showdown value when they have a pair. Because many times you should actually be turning pairs into bluffs when it's blocking your opponent's strong holdings. Whenever you have a quote unquote value hand that could win at the showdown, but probably just doesn't, you should often look to turn that hand into a bluff. Let's take a look at an example here. We have 9-8 of spades. We raise it up. 
big blind calls. You can all see my screen, right? If you all can see my screen, do me a favor, click the like button below. Also click the subscribe button if you're watching here on YouTube. All right, we raise it up. Flop comes, ace, king, two. This is a spot where we should be betting very, 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 very frequently with our entire range. Why? We raise from early position. Our range should be quite strong. Big blind calls with all sorts of junk. They're gonna check the flop. We're gonna continuation bet a ton. Let's take a look at what the, actually, this is not the first hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, oh, this is the first hand. There we go. Ace, king, two. Here is the GTO solution. As we see, 9-8 suited betting very, very frequently in this spot. Interestingly enough, GTO strategy uses very big bet sizes on this board, right? Why? Because we have a big range advantage. Okay? And we have a big nut advantage. So we're betting in this scenario very, very frequently. As we see, 9-8 is betting the vast majority of the time using a smattering of bet sizes. Okay? So we're going to be betting here. We decide to go small this time. Is that GTO approved? Yeah, mostly a small bet is used of, of the bet sizes. About half the time you're betting, you're betting small. Opponent calls. Fine. I can already tell you, we're going to be bluffing off here a lot. Because we have all the big hands in our range. You always bet big when you have a big range advantage. No. We have the tournament masterclass at Poker Coaching where we have a flow chart that will essentially help you figure out if you should be betting mostly big or mostly small. And it's based on a few things, but nut advantage is very important. Who has more nut hands? Also, range advantage is important, but also how well the opponent's range connects with the board. On this ace-king two flop, if you think about the hands, your opponent is going to check call with. It's gonna be an ace, which is gonna call any bet, which should usually lead you to bet big. It's gonna be a king, which will call any bet, which should usually lead you to bet big because our aces and our kings beat our opponents, aces and kings, right? And then stuff like straight draws, which you don't mind getting money in against, right? So those are all pretty good hands. When your opponent's range connects pretty well with the board, meaning the hands that they are gonna continue with are obviously strong, that's often an indicator that you wanna be betting bigger when you have the range slash nut advantage. Turns an eight, should we keep betting? This is a spot where old Jonathan Little a long time ago would just check it back every time. But new studied Jonathan Little goes for the big bet. Why a big bet? Because we have pocket aces and pocket kings and pocket eights and ace king in our range, right? Let's take a look at what GTO does on the turn here. GTO with 9-8 suited goes either a little bit over pot or pot the vast majority of the time. Now look, I realize I, I inputted a lot of bet sizes into the solver here today to try to just like really show all of the options you have. In reality, you should, assuming you're not trying to play like the perfect GTO strategy, you could probably just take all the 120% bets and just pot them and that's gonna be fine, right? That way you essentially have a pot size bet and a 33% pot bet, which is perfectly reasonable. So let's take a look at the hands that the solver does opt to bluff in this scenario. Solver is opting to bluff with all the eights. Also still some queen jack, queen 10, jack 10. 10-9 goes for a bluff. Remember I said 90 would often go for a bluff if you had nothing. So as you see like 10-9 doing that right here. 8-7 also going for a bluff. And essentially you're trying to get your opponent off of an ace or a king in this situation. And also notice our value range here, right? Take a look at our value range. Our value range is essentially two pair and better. We see king eight value betting. We don't have king two, right? So our value range in this spot is very, very strong. We're, our, I, guess, I guess we're betting like ace nine and better, right? So yeah, something like ace nine and better is value betting. Notice a seven and lower, mostly checks. The majority of our kings opt to check. So when we are betting, we're extremely polarized, but our range is like so strong to the point that we do get to bet this spot very, very frequently. And it turns out the gut shot straight draws, the various eights and the just like total junk hands are pretty good ones to go for the bet. All right, opponent calls. How do you feel whenever you pot it on the turn and the opponent calls? Pretty unhappy, huh? Rivers of four spades, opponent checks. All in. Old Jonathan Little said, eh, eh, showdown value. But no, 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 no. Easy all in. Easy all in. 
Let's take a look at what we're jamming. All the eights are shoving for the most part, right? Notice here, queen jack, queen 10, and jack 10 actually do not bluff. Why would you not bluff those hands, but you'd bluff with an eight? Take a second, think about it. Well, whenever you have an eight, you block your opponent's calling range to some extent. You make it a little bit harder for them to have to pair, right? What if they lead on the turn? Then your opponent's awful at poker. Why in the world would your opponent ever lead on the turn in a scenario where they are against an incredibly strong range? The times your opponent should lead the turn is when the turn increases their equity and EV, and that is not the case here at all, because I have aces and kings and eights and ace eight suited and pocket ace, etc. This would be a horrible, horrible, horrible spot for the opponent to lead the turn. If they lead the turn, they're just going to get demolished. Um, why does pocket nines check the turn? Because it has some showdown value. Pocket nines has more showdown value than an eight. Also, it has fewer outs to improve, right? Notice all the pairs, queens to nines, are very often going to check here. We discuss this thoroughly at PokerCoaching.com, where you want to classify your hands between premium made hands, which is usually top pair, strong kicker, and better, draws, usually obvious draws, marginal made hands, and junk. Junk is very obvious. Um, sometimes you're betting junk, sometimes you're not. Often you're just giving up with it, but not here because we have so many strong hands. Um, draws usually bet, as we see here, the majority of the gut shots do bet. Marginal made hands mostly check. And as we see, what is a marginal hand here, right? In this scenario, a marginal hand is ace x, like weaker ace x, down to pocket nines, right? I suppose you could call these marginal made hands, but they're not really. They're going to fold if your opponent bets the river. So these are all hands that are checking behind on the turn, very often looking to call a river bet. They are hands that do not want to play a big pot, right? And eights normally would be classified, or very often would be classified as a marginal made hand, but not in this spot because we don't have nearly as many logical bluffs. Like, we, we, we need to find bluffs in this scenario. And the opponent's ace-x and king-x are often quite bad compared to our ace-x, right? Which is going to result in us needing to find lots of bluffs. And the eights also have relatively little showdown value. Okay? What if your opponents lead because they don't know what they're doing? Then you're going to win all the money. What do you mean? What if you're playing with them? You're going to win all the money. It's the easiest game in the world when your opponent's blundering left and right. I'm, I'm, I'm confused about this question. If your opponents make gigantic errors on a regular basis, and you don't, you win all the money. Right? What are all the hands we're jamming for value on the river? It's going to be strong to, uh, like, good, good top, top pairs and better, right? Good top pairs and better. Let's take a look. Um, we're jamming all the eights as bluffs, right? Not jamming queen highs and jack highs, funny enough. Um, ace two, obviously two pair jams, sets jam. Looks like ace 10 mostly checks, ace jack mostly bets. So ace jack and better is going for value. Again, these are relatively small portions of our range at this point. But um, ace king, ace king and better, right? So our, our value range in this scenario is very, 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 very premium at this point. Okay. Let's take a look at another similar spot. Early position raise again, which you should know means our range is quite strong, right? Ace, king, queen, they check. We're going to be betting pretty big most of the time. They call. Turn is the five. They check. This is another spot where a lot of people just check it back. But it's a bet. It's a bet. What's going on my webcam over here? Is this program functioning right? I think it is. Eh, okay. We decide to go for the bet. They call. River is a two. They check. Do we go for it? Same story as before. We block the two pair. They very likely have a king or better at this point, and I have all the nuts. Right? I have all the nuts. So this is the spot where we jam. We jam. Sometimes they're going to call you. Sometimes they just have jack 10 and check called it down as they should and we're going to lose. But very often they're going to be sitting here with king x or ace x, which is going to fold. And if they call you here with every ace x, they're actually probably torching their money a little bit. Everyone keeps wanting to go back to what if they lead the turn. If they lead the turn here, we have all the aces. Don't fold all of your aces, obviously. If they lead here, you want to be asking what is their leading strategy, right? 
since you all want to discuss how to play against someone who's leading, which is not the topic of today. This is not an Ask Me Anything. If they are leading in this scenario, you want to ask, what does their range look like? Is their range premium hands? Then fold all of your marginal stuff and all your junk, right? Is their range garbage? Call with all of the hands that come in at showdown, raise everything else, right? If their range is um, all marginal hands, like King X, well, the next question becomes, will they fold it to a raise? If they will, raise with everything that can't be King X, right? So this is a spot where it's an incredibly exploitative scenario. Most of the time, I think most bad players who are leading here just think they have the best hand. So if they just think they have the best hand, then they probably have a good hand. So you just fold, right? Depending on the lead size, size of course. If they pot it, you fold. If they bet 20% pot, you don't fold. All right, back over here to this hand. Do we value bet ace, queen on the river? Yeah, definitely. Don't they have more jack 10 than us? Yes, but we have... Aces, kings, queens, ace, king, ace, queen, king, queen, right? We have all of those. They're going to three bet a lot of those before the flop, which gives us effective nut advantage. You have to realize that whenever you say who has more nuts, it's not who has more of the exact jack 10 nuts. It's who has more of the effective nuts, right? And you also have to remember who has more ace x, the bad ones. The opponent does. Who has more king x, the bad ones. The opponent does right? Who has more queen X the bad ones? The opponent does. So yeah, they have all 16 nuts, but we have at least four of them. And um, we also have aces, kings, queens, etc. that they do not. All right, let's take a look at another spot. Next, let's discuss using low equity bluffs. Something else is kind of difficult to find because very often the logical bluffs come from gut shot straight draws, over cards, backdoor flush draws, etc. If you only barrel the turn with the good draws though, you are not bluffing often enough. And sometimes you need to use low equity bluffs that have good card removal and blockers. I'm gonna give you a few examples of this. Here we have King X suited. We raise it up on the button, of course. Big blind calls. Jack, nine, five, they check. We're gonna continuation bet. You think John is only looking at the YouTube chat. It says hero call on Twitch. <laughs> No, no, I'm looking at all the, all the chat. To be fair, look, you all may not believe this, but this takes a little bit of brain power for me to present this presentation to you. And also, to read the chat over here, it's, uh, it's a little bit tough. It's a little bit tough. I do my best. Hope you all appreciate it. If you appreciate it, do me a quick favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons below. Click the subscribe button. Click the notification bell. Click all the buttons. Why are we bluffing with missed draws when, they're so, when we have obvious bluffs? And said, why not choose to bluff with air? Because when we have the bottom pair type hand, right, the bottom pair type hand blocks the opponent's calling range. It makes it harder for them to have two pair that has an easy, easy call, right? All right, here we continuation bet using a relatively big size. This is a spot where we should be betting not all that often, but when we do bet, we're going to use pretty mixed sizes in this scenario because we have lots and lots of very strong hands, but also lots of strong, or like, like marginal-ish hands, like a nine or a jack, right? That's likely good. Okay, Robert says, what if the villain's a ninja? <laughs> yeah, what if they're a ninja? What if they're an airplane pilot? Right, okay. All right, all right, everybody, all right, all right, all right. This is not a comedy show. If you want a comedy show, go to the other people's channels, okay? We're serious poker players here. What was I talking about? All right, here we raise the king two suited. Big blind calls. Flop comes. They check. We are betting using a pretty big size. As we see, all these hands with low kickers often bet pretty frequently using a mostly big size. King X and Queen X in this scenario both go pretty big, okay? Turn comes. Eight. They check. We're sitting here with this gross, nasty king two. What do we do now, sharks? You think we go for it? Do we go for it with all our king twos or just some of them? What do you think? Against the calling station, don't continuation bet flops like this. Yeah, you should be, uh, you should not continuation bet nearly as often against someone who doesn't fold. All right. Let's take a look at what GTO does in this scenario. GTO, on the turn, opts to bet big with all 
the King twos. All of them. All of them. It's a powerful spot. In this scenario, we essentially don't want to block the hands that the opponent will logically fold. What hands will the opponent logically fold on the turn? They're going to logically fold random hands that contain stuff like a 10 if you blast them, right? Will they fold a 10 if you blast them? Maybe, maybe not. Will they fold a 7 or a 6? Probably, right? You put them in a pretty nasty spot. Um, what about random queen? Will they fold a random queen if you blast them? Probably. Notice queen also has a gut shot, which is quite nice. So queen's going to be a really good card to bluff with. Uh, as you see here, queen seven, queen six, queen four, queen three, queen two bets every time, right? But we see these, essentially something you'll, you'll see very regularly is that when you have a card, like a four, a three, or a two, that does not really interact with the range of hands that your opponent would start with before the flop, because they're going to play fewer fours, threes, and twos than other middle connected cards, right? That usually leads you to want to be bluffing a little bit more often. Kind of a confusing topic, confusing concept, but this is something you see very, very consistently. Is this the buttons range? Yes, this is the buttons range after we bet the flop. And something you will very frequently see when you look at the solver are these low, big, car big card, little card hands where the little card is below the board, like four, three, and two. These hands often do go for the bluff. No one folds the continuation bets these days. But, but, they fold the turns and river bets. So here, we do pull out the pot size bet. Pot size bet in this spot feels pretty nasty to like me naturally as a tournament player because notice we only have 100K left if we fail. But um, if we go over here and look at GTO, pot size bet is used a lot of the time and the king two does go for the pot size bet a lot of the time. Notice though, two thirds pot bet is mostly used, which is, which is what I would have done here. In this scenario, I think I would have gone more like you know, 50K, give or take. Isn't king two suited not in your range most of the time? Yeah, some chunk of the time it's not in your range because you check it or you bet it differently. You have to realize the way the Pio Solver works is if you take a look at this, remember we bet big on the flop, right? That means that the times we bet it small are no longer in our range, right? So we would have played it differently on a previous betting round, which is why you see only like, I don't know what this is, 25% of the king two in this range at this point. All right, let's take a look at another hand similar to this. Very often, if you all are nitty, we have we have the, the nitty, nitty ninjas over here in the chat. If you're a nitty ninja and you don't play the king two, you will play the ace two suited, right? Let's take a look at this one. Similar scenario, right? Is this different in cash games? No, it's not. We bet they call, turns a two. I'm sorry, not a two, it's a four. They check, we bet again. They call. Everybody always asks, what happens if they call? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen if they call? You're going to be all in. <laughs> this is a situation where you need to be blasting them. Why? Because while they do have some eights here, we have all the king queens. And we also have some eights too. If you think about the bluffs in our range in this spot, we are going to have a large pile of eights. Right? Our bluffing range is going to be a lot of queens and a lot of eights. The eights just got there. So... In this scenario, we need to find some bluffs. We need to find some bluffs. So what bluffs do we have? Not a lot. <laughs> if you think about it, we really don't have a lot here, right? Um, in this scenario, we want to quote unquote block the calling range, but that doesn't really matter. That, that's not so relevant. So in this scenario, we just want to be not blocking the hands that they are going to reasonably fold. And very often that's going to result in having the, the, the low nonsense cards for uh, the three and the two in this case. So you're going to see in the scenario, if you had ace two, king two, queen two, these are going to be hands that are going to bluff very, very, very frequently. All right, let's take a look at one more thing that you all are probably not doing myself as well sometimes. A lot of people do not make small bets out of position on the river but they are incredibly effective. You do not always need to use a large size when you are bluffing because quite often you would like to use a small size when you're value betting. Now again, this presumes we're gonna to want to be balanced, right? Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. 
I'll tell you all another secret here today. One of my favorite bluffs in the whole wide world, <laughs> in the whole world of poker sharks, is to use a small river bet against players who, let's say, think they're sophisticated. They think they can read me like a book. They think that I would only bet small when I'm trying to get called. Therefore, I must have a value hand when I bet small. So they fold almost everything. If your opponent is going to make gigantic exploitative folds against small bets on the river because they think you must be trying to get value because you're so bad that you could never possibly mix in any bluffs in your range, this becomes an amazing spot to run a bluff. And <laughs> I have printed money with this one in high stakes tournaments. So quite often, it's best to target your opponent's garbage hands not just their good hand, but their garbage hands that will fold to any bet size. And you have to realize, whenever you bluff small, it's going to fail a lot. And it should fail a lot, but that's okay. Quite often, if you're betting tiny, you only need to win 20, 30, 40% of the time. Not very often at all. Okay? So let's take a look at another hand. Similar spot as before, except for we're in our opponent's seat. Flop comes... Jack 10 9, look familiar. Look familiar. All right. We check the continuation bet. What do we do here? Do we raise or do we call? We're certainly not folding. No Nitty Ninjas in the chat. Come on, Nitty Ninjas. Just realized Ninja Jesse's here. What if they're a Ninja Jesse? What do we do? How do we play against the Ninjas? Let's take a look at what the solver does here. Solver. Ops to raise with, where's king eight? Some king eight suited. Probably the, probably the clubs, right? Hap, this happy enough to get it in, if I had to guess? Yeah, that would make sense. Notice not actually all that much raising in this scenario. And that's just because the opponent's going to have a lot of hands in this spot that can reasonably continue, right? If they have any queen, they can continue. If they have clubs, they can continue. If they have a jack or a 10, they can continue, right? So this is a spot where they have lots and lots of good hands. And and very importantly, very importantly, the opponent's using a two-thirds pot size bet, right? I mean, we can just go right by... Actually, no, we can't. Uh, we could, if you look at what your opponent's two-thirds pot size range should be, should be, I know your opponents may play differently, but their range should be quite polarized. So what are we going to check raise here? GTO, in this spot, likes to check raise. King, queen for the nuts. Queen, jack, top pair, great kicker. Queen, eight for the nuts. Effective nuts, I know. A few queen highs. Eight, seven for the nuts. And a few flush draws, right? So it check raises some queens for the good end of the straight. Check raises some low flush draws, and it check raises some very high equity flush draws. Some sporadic king X, some sporadic king eight offsuit. Okay, so, you know, this is a spot where we could go for it, but I think you probably just want to call. We do call, turns to four, we check. They check it back, they decide to not go for it. On the river, what do we do? You think King High has any showdown value? Definitely not. Um, what do we want to block here? King Jack, King 10, Queen Jack, Queen 10, King 9, Queen 9. Stuff like that. Those are very logical hands. What are we trying to get to fold? We're trying to get Ace High to fold here, I think, a lot, right? Ace King, Ace Queen, Ace X trying to get um, a nine to fold, trying to get like pocket sevens to fold, right? We're trying to get some pretty weak hands to fold. This is a spot where if we do bet big, yeah, we may be able to get um, like a 10 to fold, but like a jack's never folding, right? So this is a spot where I think we need to go small because we are targeting a relatively weak range, right? We're trying to get pretty weak stuff to fold in this scenario. And we got to presume we have no showdown value, right? Effectively none. Even if we did have a little bit of showdown value, if you give us like bottom pair, I'm not going to say we should bluff bottom pair. I guess we can look at the solver and see what we should do. But um, I think this is a spot where we need to go for some giant bets and some small bets. We need to have a very mixed bet size here. Uh, let's see what GTO does. All in, all in, goodness gracious. 
All in is uh, two and a half times pot. <laughs> All in, 15% of the time. Pot size, 3%. So you could probably just lump those in with all in. 66% pot, basically none. You can lump those in with 33. And uh, a lot of small betting here. And a lot of 10% pot betting too. Ooh, ooh tricky spot, 10% pot betting. Um, so we're going to look at a few things here. We're going to take our time. Which hands go all in? The nuts, king, queen. The nuts, some queen, eight. Uh, the nuts, eight, seven. These flushes, these these hands down here are going to be flushes. So nut, fl nut flushes. So we see we're jamming basically a flush, or sorry, straight and better, plus some bluffs. Notice queen seven, some portion of the time. Notice king eight, king seven, ace eight, queen seven, queen six, queen five. All of these hands going for an over bet 2.5x pot all in a decent chunk of the time. You ever 2x potted on the river here? Most people don't. Most people don't. But you have to realize, in this scenario, your opponent would likely bet some flush draws on the turn, so they don't have a ton of flushes. We would check call a lot of our flushes on the flop, well, flush draws on the flop. And also, our opponent doesn't have a lot of straights, and we do, right? If we look at our range here, we actually have a pretty good amount of straights in it. So we have a lot of straights, and we have a lot of flushes. That allows us to overbet jam some portion of the time. Okay, fine. What if we're not going to overbet jam? And we're going to go for the, uh, not the tiny bet, but the small bet. The 33% pop bet. 33% pop bet is made mostly with marginal made hands, if I had to guess, right? It's going to be this color. So we have queen 10, middle pair, king jack, top pair, queen jack, top pair, queen 10, middle pair, king 10, middle pair, jack 10, two pair, jack 9, two pair, jack 8, top pair, jack seven, jack six, all top pairs. So all the top pairs are going 33% uh, pot. Lots of tens going 33% pot. And um, a smattering of bluffs. If you look around at uh, this random like uh, king eight, like we have, that goes for the third pot bet some portion of the time. Hands like ace eight go for third pot some portion of the time. Uh, what else do we have for third pot? We have this king eight here, this king seven here right? We have some queen X going for a third pot, queen two here going a third pot, queen five for a third pot as bluffs. So you see, like we are picking some bluffs in our small bet size, right? Then if you look at our tiny bet size, that's going to be this lighter red color. We're doing that with stuff like bottom pairs and a few stone bluffs, right? So we see a lot of nine, seven, nine, eight, ten, eight. Actually, these, eh, what color is this? It's kind of hard to tell the colors, I know. So it looks like uh, these, some middle pairs are going for the tiny bet. You're going to find that in general, the tiny bet size is used on the river with a little bit of nuts, tiny, tiny bit of nuts, a lot of like bottom pair type hands, and then a tiny bit of bluffs. Whereas your medium bet size, 33% pot here is used with a lot of marginal made hands, like 70, 80% marginal made hands, like 80%, 85% marginal made hands, and then a small portion of bluffs then your giant bet size is going to be mostly value hands. Call it, um, you know, in this scenario, probably 60-ish 60, 60 percent value hands and then 40 percent bluffs. And that's going to put your opponent in a very tough spot. You got to make sure, though, that your giant bet size is used with hands that primarily can get called by, well, you're not going to get called by better hands all that often, right? You would not want to use a giant overbet here with something like 10-9. That would be pretty bad. Notice here, 10-9 is 33% pot bet size, right? And that's because if you 2x pot it all in, they're not going to call you with all that many worse hands. So that's why we see in this scenario, the giant overbets are made primarily with straights and better, right? Should we start attacking capped ranges with overbets? Sure. But if your opponent's range is capped, you have to ask, what is it capped at? If it's capped at two pair, it's not all that capped, right? But if it's capped at, um, you know, middle pair, sure. Like right here, our opponent's range is pretty much capped, right? Capped meaning they probably don't have all that many nut hands. But we can't just start blasting them because they are going to have flushes sometimes, right? So anyway, in this scenario, one thing you always want to ask yourself, especially when you're playing against like non-really good players, is what am I trying to get them to fold? And is that a logical hand? So here, like I said, we're trying to get them to fold a nine. Very logical. They could definitely have it. 
We're trying to get them to fold pocket fives. Very logical hand, they could easily have it. We're trying to get them to fold ace high. Very logical hand, they could easily have it. How much do we need to get them off of ace high or nine or pocket fives? And the answer is just not a lot. Just not a lot. How many buy-ins should you have before you run this bluff? It's not a great question. The better question is how many buy-ins should you have before playing the game to begin with? Make sure you check out my bankroll Bible. It's completely free at pokercoaching.com slash bankroll. Do you all enjoy this today? If you did, click like, click subscribe. I would appreciate it. These are my top three bluffing spots that you are probably missing. You're probably not turning pairs into bluffs often enough, especially when you have a tight range with no obvious bluffing candidates. It's very important. You need to have a tight range to begin with, and you need to be struggling to find enough bluffs. When you can't find enough bluffs, turns out bottom pair is what goes for it. Next, you're probably not using low equity bluffs. You usually want to be looking for bluffs when they have really good card removal effects, despite having like no equity. And you also want to use small bluffs on the river, especially out of position. These bluffs are the nuts. <laughs> Um, they don't work. They don't have to work very often. And they, to be fair, against most, a lot of people are not going to work very often. But players have a really difficult time defending against small bets, especially like we just talked about in the chat. Their ranges are going to be somewhat capped, and especially when you logically target stuff like ace high and under pairs. Right? Those hands have a very, very difficult time defending. All right, it's Cinco de Mayo. We're having a sale at PokerCoaching.com. I want to tell you about it at PokerCoaching.com. I have accumulated a gigantic library of incredibly high level poker content. I'm putting Poker Coaching Premium on sale for a big discount. You can get it at about half off. If you sign up for a long period of time, you save a lot of money. You sign up for a little bit, you save a little bit of money. With Poker Coaching Premium, you get full access to my tournament masterclass. We actually referenced it earlier today. Also, my cash game masterclass. We have 30 day tournament challenges, 30 day cash game challenges where I send you a piece of content to study every single day for a month that if you do, will get you in the habit of studying. It will get you up to speed and it will result in your poker skills improving. Here's one of my, well, it is, he is my most successful poker coaching student, Blas Scarmaker Zerzhao, absolute crusher. He has about two and a half million in lifetime tournament earnings, including a cash for $1.3 million and a $5,000 buying tournament on party poker, which he got into for $5.00. Pretty, pretty good run up, five into 1.3 million. Also recently, September 16th, cash for another 550K, absolute crusher. And the World Series of Poker is coming up. Feels like it's coming up immediately. I know it's in like six months, but I actually did a World Series preparation sessions with Blas. Is that a sentence? We did a lot of sessions where essentially I went through a lot of his hands, a lot of his questions, and basically just answered everything I possibly could to make sure that he was well prepared. And, um, you know, his World Series of Poker was marginal, as very often it is. But shortly after that, he took fourth place in the WPT Online Championships for 550K. Let's hear his thoughts about this experience. Hi. I would like to take this moment and say thank you to Jonathan Little who, as you may or may not know, contacted me in December after my deep run in the party poker in New Zealand and offered me coaching in exchange for me sending him hands uh, which he'll review and make a product out of. And as we are nearing the end of this process, I would like to share some thoughts. Well, the first thing that really struck me out of the blue was Jonathan's classification of hands into premium made hands, marginal made hands, chores and junk. He also points at this quite nicely in mastering small stakes moment to hold them. And it made me realize I was turning way too many marginal made hands into bluffs. He likes I to bluff. was under bluffing with draws and then sticking in pots with too many junk hands, too many junk here part of my range range. And this idea of thinking in ranges and mixing it with exploitative play um, which he really points out quite nicely in his reviews and really made my decision making a lot better than it was and it also made me uh, easier to spot uh, mistakes in my game on my own 
and when you are spotting mistakes on your own uh, it's a lot easier to um, strive to work to improve those mistakes rather than when you're just ignorant to, that you're even making mistakes the whole process did um, make me want make me want to work hard on my game every day and this is really the one thing I would like to thank Jonathan the most is he really felt, made me fell in love with the game so much more than I was ever before and I'm really looking forward to um, put this knowledge to use and try to do my best all right, they were here from Blas. He's absolutely crushing it. I'm glad that I made him fall in love with poker more than before. That's a that's a nice that's a nice thing to think. I don't think of myself as a, a matchmaker, but apparently we matched Blas up with poker pretty well. So, people who sign up to Poker Coaching Premium get full access to my tournament masterclass. Over 75 parts to this, including many many quizzes. After every single part, there's a quiz to be sure. You fully understand everything that Blas just talked about there and uh, a whole lot more. If you liked our presentation today, the first you know, 30, 35 minutes of this webinar, that's a lot of what the Tournament Masterclass is, except for I go through and really give you clear, implementable strategies so that you don't have to just try to memorize what a solver does and do it at the table. You will know which hands to bluff and which hands to not bluff, right? You will know these things because there will be systems in place to ensure that you are playing well, this course is not for sale. It is exclusively for Poker Coaching Premium members, okay? If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you have access to this. It's right there in the Courses tab. Here is a laundry list of items in the Tournament Masterclass. As you see, we discuss how to play all the stack sizes, not just a few, even though, you know, a lot of tournament poker is shallow stack play. You do know how to play deep stack to some extent. We also discuss how to play all the spots after the flop. Really, this is comprehensive. It's it's a big course. This course is not for people who, you know, want to sit back and have a beer and watch 15 minutes of poker each day and play poker one time per quarter. That's not really who this is for. This is for serious poker players who want to improve their skills. So if that's you, check it out. Also, we discuss things like ICM. I know this is just three little letters, but it is a gigantic portion of the course. We also discuss adjusting to various tournament formats like satellites, um, six-handed tournaments, stuff like that. We discuss bankroll management. We discuss various other topics, and uh, we'll call them pro tips. And I also go through a bunch of hand histories that I have done well in recently. All of these took place over the last uh, six or eight months or so. And, um, you know, we've had a pretty good run. Also, Cash Game Masterclass. This is a 29-part masterclass where I teach you how to crush cash games. Again, this is just included at pokercoaching.com slash Cinco. If you have any questions about the sale, etc., head over to that website, pokercoaching.com slash Cinco, and check it out. Okay, go there. Also, you get access to everything we have at pokercoaching.com. We don't just have a few courses. We have over 1,200 interactive quizzes, and we upload more and more and more every single day. Let's hear what Blas thought about the quizzes. The hand quizzes. Well, I actually made uh, a goal to, well, go through all hand quizzes in ePokerCoaching.com. I'm halfway through them, and they really did it. did improve my game really significantly. Good. That's what we're going for. We're going for significant improvement, not little bits of improvement. Significant. Improvement and essentially the quizzes are like you sitting down playing a poker hand and then getting immediate feedback from a world-class poker player after every single betting round as to whether or not you played well or if you played poorly and if you do that over and over and over again you will get feedback here's one of our other poker coaching students longtime student here we have Chris J O'Neill on Twitter check him out. He had a new high score the other day. He cashed for $18,000 in an online poker tournament. He's been playing the Pennsylvania tournaments. He is an American poker player, living in America, grinding it out. And I just want you to take a look at his tournament graph. This is just on Pennsylvania Poker Stars, okay? Hasn't even been around all that long. He has basically gone straight up. He'll say, wow, that's a really beautiful cash game graph. 
Oh, no, 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 no. This is a tournament graph. He has profited $100,000 on poker coaching, on a poker coaching, on Poker Stars Pennsylvania over the course of a thousand games, you know, playing average stake $87 or what's it, $67? $87. So, you know, all the big games on this site with an ROI of 61%. I actually met Chris about, must have been two and a half or three years ago now. I met him at Borgata. Whenever I go to play live poker, I try to have breakfast with my students. So we got together. There were about, I don't know, 12 or 15 people there. I met Chris and Chris was like, kind of new to poker. He was, he was young. He must've been 21 or 22. He was super excited. And he's like, all right, I'm going to take a, I'm taking a big shot today. I'm going to play the thousand dollar six handed tournament, which was the tournament I went there to play. And I was like, well, you're probably taking a shot. <laughs> Good luck. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. And you know what he did? He won the thing. <laughs> he won the thousand dollar six handed tournament at Borgata that day, right after we had breakfast together. So that was a lot of fun, and I'm glad to see him grinding it out online and just crushing it with this. <laughs> I've never seen tournament graph look this good, honestly. And someone actually commented, highest score is only 18 buy-ins. Well, $18,000. But you got to realize, these are relatively small field tournaments. It's as if he's going to play at his local casino with 50 people. And if you play these small field tournaments, often and on a regular basis, inevitably what happens is you don't have a whole lot of swings. This is kind of like what I used to do back when I used to play sit and goes online. I had not a 60% ROI like Chris here, but a 5% ROI. Five. Not a lot. But I played a ton of games. And my graph was just a literal straight up line. It was amazing. And if you find a game you can beat, play it a lot, this is what your graph will look like. So far, I spent over $350,000 hiring world-class coaches for all of you to create content inside of Poker Coaching Premium. And to be fair, it's a little bit selfish. I hire the coaches for me too, because I like studying. I like improving my skills. All the spots today, I learned because of all the other poker coaching coaches and because of the ways they taught me to dig deep and study, right? I've improved because of them. Here are our world-class coaches. We have Faraz Jaka. He was WPT Player of the Year. When you win WPT Player of the Year, they give you this giant trophy here. He must have one at his house as well. We have James Romero, super crusher. He was in the top 10 live poker players in the world pre-COVID. We have Burt Stevens, Giraffe Ganger, number one tournament player in the world online. He streams regularly for the Poker Coaching Premium members. Um, it, it's great. I mean, that, that might be my favorite thing in the, on the website where you get to watch the literal number one online tournament player in the world stream for like eight hours. He, he's fun to watch too. Yeah, he he uh, enjoys himself, has a good time, he answers all the questions that come in from the members, and he guarantees a final table every single session. And, and he makes it happen like 85% of the time. We also have Tommy Angelo. Tommy Angelo, I've learned a ton from. Um, just all sorts of great things from him. We have um, Brad Wilson, world class cash game player, he has a great podcast, Chasing, Chasing Poker Greatness. Oh my God, I mean, like everyone here is great. Take a screenshot, look them all up. One player you may not know is Ryan O'Donnell. Ryan just made an incredibly in-depth spin and go course. A lot of you told me you wanted spin and go content. Look, I have been very hesitant to make any content for anything besides no limit hold'em tournaments and no limit hold'em cash games. Why? Because honestly, I don't think those games are played all that much. But we made a big investment here with Ryan O'Donnell to get him to make a giant spin and go course. He's out there making content on YouTube. You can follow him on Twitter at Three Handed Poker. If you like spinning goes, he's the guy. He is the super crusher. His graph goes straight up too. And I've learned a ton from him. So make sure you check out his gigantic spin and go course. It's like my tournament course. It's incredibly comprehensive. And I learned a lot in the process of just reviewing the content. And uh, that taught me I better not be playing high stakes spinning goes because those guys are good. All right. I also pay our coaches five figures every single month. Solid money. Not, not small five figures, mid five figures to make these interactive quizzes, live webinars, all of this content. And it's an investment in all of you, right? It's my job to help you become the best players you can be. Now, look, obviously I'm not gonna charge you the five figures that I'm paying or even like $500 per month like some of the other training sites out there. But if I did charge you that, you know, pretty high price of $500 per month and all it did was let you win just one big pot each session, that you would not have otherwise won. What is it worth to win just one extra big pot? 
If you're playing something like one two no limit and you get to win an extra $100 or $200 pot and you play poker 15 days per month, it's $1,500. And that's if you're playing one, two, no limit. What if you're playing like bigger games, right? It's just an absolute steal. What if all I do is let you attend the live weekly coaching webinars with our coaches who have a combined tournament earnings of over $56 million and a whole lot more in live cash games and online cash games and let you ask them your biggest poker questions every single week in real time. It's what we offer. You can ask the best players in the world whatever you want and they'll answer it. What is that worth? And what if all I did was give you a way to put yourself in thousands of poker situations every single day and get immediate instant feedback from our coaches in our quizzes so that you have a way of practicing every single day, even if you can't get to the casino for whatever reason, maybe because there's a pandemic happening. What if you still got to get in new situations and get immediate feedback all the time? It's like you get to play poker and get coaching whenever you want on demand. Would that be worth the 500 bucks a month? Well, if you said yes, then now's the most amazing time for you to join Poker Coaching Premium because during the Cinco de Mayo sale, you can save $500 when you join Poker Coaching Premium for one whole year. Not just $500 for a month, right? We're gonna be getting, giving you a big discount for the entire year. As you see here, if you sign up for, your, you can get your first month for 49 bucks. If you wanna sign up for three months total, Get 200 bucks for a year, $688. That's a $500 savings. And then we also give discounts for two years and three years. And look, you got to realize I created Poker Coaching Premium to give you everything you could possibly need to achieve your full poker potential. And if I fail to deliver on it, I do not want or deserve your money. If you are not completely satisfied with Poker Coaching Premium, with, let my team know within 30 days and we'll give you a free refund, 100% refund. Cost you nothing. If you do not like the work that I do and the work that my team of pros do, we do not want or deserve your money. We try to do good work though so that you are happy as can be and it turns out the students stay subscribed because we help you win a whole lot more money than the price we charge you. I learned this a long time ago. If you add value, it's all you really got to do to make it in this world. You need to add value in some way. And look, I don't have a whole lot of skills, but I've devoted my life to poker and I'm happy to share that with all of you. And um, well, with any luck, it adds a lot of value. I'm quite confident it does because my students tell me all the time. So that's gonna be it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning about these three bluff spots that you are probably not taking. If you learned something today, do me a quick favor and click the like and subscribe buttons below. Check out pokercoaching.com slash Cinco. We're having one of our biggest sales of the year. Check it out. Do not miss out. Amazing content as always, says Chanun. Well, thank you very much. If you're already a member, can you resubscribe? Yes, absolutely. 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 James Romero. James Romero is beautiful and smart to you guess. He is a beautiful man and very smart. You love my tournament masterclass. It helped your game, says Boza. Well, great. I'm glad to hear it. Come on with this name. Small Whiner Boy says that Bert, <laughs> Faraz, and Matt's streams are the nuts. I completely agree. Absolutely, completely agree. Anyway, glad that you're all enjoying PokerCoaching.com. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of you. Scott says you play home games in Alaska. You, and you can confirm your theory that you have the softest games. I've never played poker in Alaska, but... I, uh, I imagine Alaskan games are pretty good. So if you can find whatever the biggest game in Alaska is, you know, they may have some really big games in Alaska. You can probably print some money. Good job. Good work. Get in there. David says you appreciate the free webinar. Well, good. I appreciate you being here. All right, Sharks, I got to go. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great rest of your week. Make sure you check out pokercoaching.com slash Cinco. Good luck. Have fun. Bye-bye.